So just to check, can everyone hear me from the Zoom? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming today. I am Fatih Aranolo, the coordinator of Mining Department Series Committee. The committee organizes the seminar series and invites speakers to come and address students, faculty, and interested industry professionals on a variety of mining related topics. Since we are on Zoom and in person today, we are, I would like to request uh, that everyone on Zoom keep their microphones muted during the presentation and unmute them only to ask questions during QA session. Just a reminder to everyone, we will be recording this session so you will be able to view it on the department YouTube channel after the seminar has concluded. Today, I would like to welcome Dr. Ian Lumis. Thank you very much for talking to us today. Dr. Ian Lumis is the technical director and principal consultant for underground mine ventilation for Worley in Denver, Colorado. He has nearly 35 years experience specializing in underground mine ventilation, including operations, consulting, education, and research. Dr. Ian Lumis will be talking to us today about their work with holistic view of costs in diesel versus battery electrical equipment trade-off. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Ian. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, well, I appreciate the invitation to, to come and uh, speak with you. I think this is the third of these seminars that I've done. Yeah. Years. So we'll look at this uh, trade off that we did, um, that I did uh, um, last year, um, and to take a bigger picture view of what's going on. So, a brief introduction to Patrick, as I already said. Uh, in this. Uh, the disclaimer here for me is that the work was done before I joined with Worley. Um, so uh, it's not a Worley product here, and that the views and conclusions are strictly mine. So it is a trade off study. And I, basically, what we're looking here is it's, it's relatively limited in scope, um, looking solely at the, the trucks. Um, Drills, uh, loaders, and other battery electric equipment versus diesel. Um, when we take the information from here, we're taking it to a uh, to feed into the preferred alternative uh, as this project would go forward. And in the bigger picture, we're looking at a cost estimate rate of about plus or minus 25%. Uh, we won't be discussing true cost, uh, just relative to what. Approaching the context of this trade-off. So within the context of this trade-off, we're really looking at some key questions here. One is, um, are we going to go diesel versus the battery electric options? Um, we're going to look at the relative impact um, on the system by classes of equipment. As we said, we'll look at the trucks, we'll look at the LHDs, uh, we'll take drills, uh, we'll take service equipment, and then we take uh, light vehicles in there as well. Um, what we're dealing with um, currently is the mismatch in the size, the capacity, and performance of some of the equipment. Um, this comes into play both in terms of the, uh, the trucks um, and, and then the loaders as well um, for us here. Uh, we'll look at matching the analogs and how these came to be um, when we were looking at last year versus maybe what we're gonna see in the next couple of years uh, in terms of this type of equipment. Uh, we're gonna look at the capital cost of things, operating costs, maintenance costs, and we bring that into the equipment. Uh, we're largely looking at this being an hourly operating cost applied uh, to the equipment. And we look at it in terms of the trucks, the TKM, 
uh, costs of dollars per ton per hour, uh, dollars per time kilometer. And as we began to build onto this um, this model that we have, that we're looking at the, the ramp and the drift profiles as we change the size of the truck, what was the effect of actually making the drift bigger or larger? Did this have a significant cost impact? We look at the ventilation raised diameters. Um, the ventilation refrigeration demands and how those balance back and forth. We also then look at some of that infrastructure. How big does it need to be? Um, and then we start getting into what's going on underground. The effect of having to take additional power underground, uh, transmit it down, and distribute it down there. Um, we'll look at a little bit of the energy balance, particularly on what happens to the electric, the electrical load. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the less than tangible effects there. Um, and by this, we talk through the health issues and what's driving that. Uh, There's one of those questions that come up how do you quantify that? So, for lack of a better name, um, we're going to be working with the Goldilocks mine. And as I said, this was based on a project that we were looking at. Um, and I just called it the Goldilocks mine because it had a couple of characteristics to it. To make it really suitable for this type of a study. It, uh, it was a new mine um, project at a brownfield site. Um, it's going to be producing about 4,000 tons a day. So you know, pretty much an ordinary, an ordinary mine. Um, we're looking at a haulage lift anywhere from 200 meters um, back to the surface um, to about 900 meters. Um, so it's in a this zone where we can uh, we can handle that. Um, we don't look beyond truck hauls in this. Thing. We we were provided with the existing so previous study um, life of line production and equipment profiles. So we knew what the production plan uh, was going to be, uh, what they were expecting, what levels they were producing, so what their their mining intensity and what their development intensity. Uh, is or would be when we we're looking at the overall scheme because of the size of the trucks we're looking at the trucks limited to only operating within the ramp just they shown in green here um, and this gives us the opportunity to have segregated airflow so the, only the air the trucks were only in the ramps when we were ventilating the ramp separately from the production line. We go in as we were working through here. We found that that 900 meters was a little above the maximum lift we could get out of a fully charged truck. So, if we looked any deeper, we would have to come up with something else if we were going to use battery trucks. Um, so, it gave us okay, here's, here's this maximum lift area. And the other factor that comes in here is given the climate where this mine was located, we were looking at needing to have some form of refrigeration here. And we had a zone above the red mark transition where, where refrigeration wasn't required. And we had a section here between transition and our critical depth where we didn't necessarily rely completely on refrigeration, but we could use refrigeration to balance ventilation to achieve the heat carrying capacity we were looking for. Anything below critical depth, we would have been relying on We would have been fully reliant. Reliant on using refrigeration. Now, if we step into the equipment profile place to begin with, um, and what analog we were using between the diesel and the battery, uh, the, the general class of equipment that the project here was based on was using a 60 ton class truck, a very large underground truck, a 20 ton class. Motor, a you know, very large production motor. And then using the standard diesel electric drill carrier uh, for the jump motors and the production drills, uh, diesel powered service equipment, <coughs> so our scissor motors, <coughs> our flat beds, um, maintenance equipment, and so forth, and then diesel electric vehicles. As we move this up, okay, what's available to us currently in the, in the foreseeable future? Uh, we were looking at a 50 ton class a haul truck in battery. We were looking at a 14 ton class loader. 
this actually gave us a, a bit of an issue that we'll see that drives the cost of the LHDs in the battery case very, very high because we see a mismatch in here. That 20 ton loader gives a three pass load into the, the truck, the 60 ton truck. About a two and a half pass load uh, loading into that 50 ton. So it has to be a little bit careful when it puts that half bucket in. Uh, when we go to the 14 ton plastic for kind of load, the 60 ton truck, now we're almost five passes. If we go to almost four passes to load, the, the 50 ton truck. So it's, it's going to add a lot to the duty cycle. So it adds to the number of loaders that we're doing. Uh, there's some currently available, um, at least in the brochures, um, battery uh, electric uh, drill carriers um, that use uh, electric to tram. And again, you plug it in uh, the same way you would conventional jumbo. Uh, on demand or opportunistic charging of the battery electric service equipment. There's several vendors doing that. Uh, and then standard battery light vehicles that we're seeing. And to begin then to say, what's the first area we really want to focus on where can we make improvements? What I've looked at here is the effect that the, the, the diesel load on the trucks, the LHDs, the drills, and we can see here that the trucks, being the biggest equipment, has got the biggest diesel load underground in it. It accounts for 55% of the, the total main point power and Almost 65% of the utilized power underground uh, on, the, on the equipment. So, where that takes us is that was going to be our number one focus. Then we would look at the LHDs and match that production equipment. This is where we get guys working. And then we can take out um, and look at drill services and LHD as the follow on to this. Um, one of the things I'm going to stop and think. And the service equipment traditionally is one of these areas where it, it tends to be some of the dirtier equipment. Um, it may not get the maintenance focus. I've had, I've commented, I've had, uh, where I've had a gas detector in my pocket, I've had the whole truck going past and the, the gas detector is doing nothing. And then you get a little scissor lift drive by and the carbon monoxide is going off. Uh, just <coughs> the maintenance of the engine. So it, it shows that. It may be small in magnitude, but it can be a, big, a bigger problem. But something there to look at a little bit later. So then as we began to now go and look and say, well, how are we going to compare apples to apples uh, to know that we're getting a good correlation between the two models? Um, what we see here is a, a bell curve for the number of trucks um, in the mine based on their own study. And I set up a, a quick model to go into the, the spreadsheet on this that then recalculated the number of diesel trucks versus the number of battery trucks. And if we put that up here, um, fairly good correlation for what we're doing here um, with the diesel truck um, and matching uh, within a, a truck in the fleet. One of the interesting things here comes in is this noticing that the, the battery truck, although you think they were going to be smaller, is actually fewer of them. One of the factors we're looking here comes in that the battery trucks, because they're running a big, uh, big motor, a much more powerful electric motor system, they can actually travel faster. It means you have to do better maintenance, but you can get a faster cycle time. And we'll see that in a bit. Um, as I said, the other factors that come in here, uh, the diesel trucks can have higher payload. Uh, typically, we look at a fueling cycle. Uh, the diesel trucks will, will, will fuel once a day. Um, the BEVs will save have to swap batteries more frequently. It adds into the cycle time and it affects where that is. Um, and the other thing will pick up that is a region. Um, and the question is always going to is the other battery truck really faster? Um, we'll see how that plays out. They certainly have the capacity for one faster. Same thing on the loaders. Um, a little bit different in the concept of how loaders were going to be managed. 
um, within the model that I put together for this, um, there was more sharing of a loader, uh, particularly when you had production and development going in the same general area uh, to keep the, the loaders from running in standby or sitting in standby. Uh, but because the loaders are not much smaller, we see a higher uh, number of loaders required. Uh, the other thing that we run into, we noted this earlier is a cycle mismatch on the loaders. And another factor that comes in and plays into the number of loaders we have is that need that on a production level, we would have to have two loaders. Uh, one drawing from the, uh, the stone and then stockpiling and one actually moving from the stockpile to load the trucks. And, and just getting hot in there. So now if we go and we look at some of the, the haulage characteristics between the, the diesel trucks and the battery trucks, we go through here. Uh, payload, obviously we see the difference there. That diesel truck has got a 20% higher payload, but it's uh, about 60% of the speed, 65% of the speed potential. Um, and this is actually on the 15% on the grade and these are set at 80% of the uh, manufacturer's indicated speed on that. Um, we look at the cycle here, this one here, looking at it at 8.2 8 kilometers. So 4.1 kilometers out, 4.1 kilometers back. The productivity that we would find for that diesel truck is running at 180 100 kilometers per hour. Um, that the battery truck, smaller payload, but faster, is actually giving us about 195 theoretical tons five kilometers per hour. Now this is where we start coming into uh, issues on the energy side. During that one cycle, the diesel truck will consume about 516 kilowatt hours of total diesel fuel. So that's, that's the mechanical work output from the fuel plus the thermal fuel, uh, all the thermal load. When we compare that, to a 162 kilowatt hours on the battery truck. And that 162 is 100, it's actually 195 kilowatt hours to come from the production level up to the surface. But when we turn around and we drive back down the hill, we get 33 of those back in regeneration. <laughs> um, so when we look at uh, the overall um, energy usage um, on, a, on a per ton kilometer basis. You can see there it's 2.9 versus 84. So, and this gets into that 37% um, efficiency range, but the, you see on the battery side where the, that 0.84 is about 37% or 2.9. Uh, so the energy side is actually much more efficient. Um, the, from the downside, we, we compare the energy on board the truck themselves. Um, the, the diesel loaders carry just over 8,000 kilowatt hours in diesel fuel on board. Um, so, and they can run and they can make those cycles all day long um, without having to stop for refueling. Um, that uh, the battery truck has got 350 kilowatt hours on board. So it's going to have to stop at some point to, to swap the battery out. And looking at that aspect of how many cycles can that battery truck do, um, if we look at the haulage lift across the bottom and the amount of energy um, that's available in the, uh, in the batteries, and the with the limit of the full charge, we move it on the vertical side at our starting depth of around 200 meters below surface. We can make six runs before we have to swap the battery out. When we get down to that 500 meter level parked out with the example we shown there, now we're going to make two runs. Uh, there's other ways that, you know, when you start looking at the aspects of, of dispatch, 
you could possibly dispatch a truck deep and then dispatch it shallow. And that's going to depend on what your production profiles are looking like. Uh, and that can be a step take further on. Now we step into the area where we're saying, well, battery electric, they, they're, they're easier to develop. You don't have to as much airflow. Air flow. You can eliminate your battery. Well, we can't really do that. When we started looking at how we compared the, the ventilation demand um, between the two uh, truck systems, and this goes then on into the, the other equipment as well, the first thing we look at is, well, what is what does MSHA or CANMAD or the local legislation tell us we have to have for the engines? And so we had to ventilate at least for that. Then we can look at it and say, well, what, what is our consensus airflow? And, and in here, what I mean with consensus airflow is this the concept is a 0.06 cubic meters per second per kilowatt uh, on the diesel engine. And that's you know, coming out of Ontario, but it also has been applied in, in many other jurisdictions as well. And it's things we simply use as rules of thumb sometimes in our planning, um, sometimes a little lower, sometimes it's a little higher. But I put it in here in a consensus because everybody pretty much agrees we can use it. Looking at newer equipment, we can look at what the EPA uh, tier rating output or the Euro spec exhaust criteria are for the engines, and how much air does it take to dilute those pollutants away that are characterized um, within those environments? And that includes the diesel particulate, that includes the um, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, everything that can come out of these products. Within this, uh, and this will come up in a little bit. If we're looking at a tier three engine, you know, with our standard ventilation practices, we can't ventilate, we cannot ventilate away the, the potential DPM off of a tier two or a tier three engine. With our conventional rules, uh, we can't afford to do it. Uh, we go to a tier four, now the, the DPM limits are so low that we can really actually care <laughs> ventilate away. The DPM we're not going to take additional steps. The next one comes in here um, is heat management. How much heat is coming off of the machine and what are we doing with it? How do we how much air do we need to limit the rise temperature rise across the machine to a level that still protects the worker from excessive heat? So the next ones in there are minimum velocity criteria. One is a dust carrying capacity of the air. You know, we're looking at a 1.5 to 2 meters per second as a minimum in our work areas. And then the last one here is kind of that lower limit, uh, about 0 0.7, 0 0.6 meters per second, that we use to ensure that we've got turbulent mixing of the airflow so that we don't end up in areas that are specified. Uh, on the battery, Electric, you'll see I have a question mark in there um, for consensus. There's some work being done to kind of characterize how much air we need, but nobody's really come up with the hey, this is going to work yet. And, and we would apply then the same uh, thought process through to how do the production motors <clears throat> work? And, what are the cycles of the production motors? Uh, and rather than taking the time, to, uh, we'll let that stand. Uh, we can start to then look at well, if we can change the size of the ventilation system, um, what can we do to when we do the airflow? What does it do to our ventilation rate? As we look at the reducing the airflow, can we reduce the air? Flow enough to go from one raised size down to a smaller raised size. This is going to end up being a step function for us because if we're looking at board raises, we're not going to have an infinitely variable reamer. We're just going to go from step to step on the reamer size, uh, which they're showing in the graph there. Uh, and they're, overall, the 
The raises in this case showed about a little less than 2% of the total lifetime cost um, with this. Um, one of the things that we do see um, is that the raises will tend to make them as large as technically viable, unless they're going to be just too humongous. Um, and, or unless there's other issues, and we would see here in the graph, if you were to drop down below 12 meters per second um, and, and tend to operate there, if we had a lot of water in the exhaust, then we run into some other issues uh, with, with how that water manages uh, in the shaft. Um, looking from the operating cost side, uh, obviously, to make the, the raise larger for a fixed flow, the pressure lost in the raise goes down. Operating cost goes way down um, for the pan. So that'll play into uh, that factor as well. When we look at what happens with the overall operating cost in this example, in the, uh, the diesel case, the, the losses within the race is kind of about 20% of the electric. 26% of the electrical cost. As we went to the BEB case, now they were down about 17%. Uh, but that includes then the fact that we're adding uh, additional electrical load on the BEB. So that's a, uh, there's a sort of a misdirection there as you're going through your data. Um, so we're going to go to the So we looked in and well, what happens if we start making these changes? How do they account for changes in the fans? Um, we'll see some step changes in the fan specs uh, with the mechanical costs. Um, and we typically look at the fan if we're using the Joy series, you know, it's, a, it's eight foot, nine foot, 10 foot, 11 foot, 12 foot fans uh, that change the vary the cost um, as we start to vary the, the peak capacity of those. Um, the cost tends to level off um, as we get to higher and higher capacity. Um, the issue from the motor side is the motors start to become very, very expensive as we increase the capacity in the fan. Um, as you can see with the, the red dots here and that uh, the uh, upward curve and then the negative curve on the top for the fan. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here, we can look and figure out what the mechanicals are going to cost and realize that that's about a third of the overall installed cost of that system. Now, in the case we had, uh, we're looking at here, we were also dealing with um, having a refrigeration plant um, to, to give us some capacity. And the question is, look, how much capacity do we need to have? Again, there's there's step changes in the refrigeration because we're working with the modular uh, chillery units. Um, we don't just go and find the exact size that we need. We'll build it up um, for modules. Uh, the bulk air cooler portion, um, we build that early. Uh, we overbuild it um, for the early life so that it works later. We'll have additional costs up front. Can we defer capital? by putting in two bulk air coolers uh, and bring a second one on later. Uh, the other, other question that comes in for some of these is if we're gonna do a cold storage system so that we can continue to produce cold water at night and we've got to store it and now we've got to build a storage tank um, for that, what is that gonna cost us? Um, you can see what we're there. So then this question then comes up, we bring all of the surface infrastructure together uh, and how does this all fit? Um, and we looked at here was a concept of doing what I would call managed cooling. So we knew how much heat we had to be able to carry in the light exhaust, but we could either do it by increasing the airflow to give us more Heat capacity in the mass of air, or we can reduce the air temperature and increase the differential temperature. Uh, or it would be a balance of, of both of those. 
And as we were going to the airflow reduction uh, and increased refrigeration, could we get to a lower capital cost? Could we get to a lower operating cost? And what we began to look at was as we began to increase refrigeration, we could bring the ventilation back, but at some point, the cost of the refrigeration then becomes higher than the cost of the ventilation. And again, it gives you the typical minimum point on your combined cost curve. Um, what I've got showing you here is a comparison that we did that on our left, at number one, so that's the full ventilation for the diesel tank. And it's this balance of some ventilation, the two lower blocks, and the refrigeration at the top. Then we backed up and we said, okay, if we did the BEV case under the same ventilation rules, we could drop off about 8% on the airflow, and it brings the cost uh, down to a little less than 80% on the ventilation side. Now, we said, okay, what happens if we began to tweak back and forth and we dropped, say, to 80% on the airflow? And when you keep the net cooling constant, but we increase refrigeration, and then we step it down. That's what's happening as we go to the right. Um, so from one all the way over to, to 45%, we shed it off 55% of the air. What happens? Well, you can see that that cost, it, it drops down, um, but it, it kind of does level out a bit. The problem we run into here is that about 80% really seems to be the practical limit of meeting all of the ventilation requirements we have. So the potential we can drop off 20% of our ventilation air um, by going from the diesel phase to the best PEV phase. So there's this 20% window in here where we can work anything to the to the right of this really gets us in a position to have a ventilation. So let's look at where all of this led us. And we look at the effect that the BEV truck case, if all we were looking at was the BEV trucks, that if we look at the fixed diesel then, so this is now against our base case, um, that as we began to consider some of the options with BEVs, we can see that the cost starts out higher meet the same criteria and it actually drops down below the uniform cost, the equal cost line in the middle, being slightly, slightly less expensive. Uh, but when we began to allow uh, some of the changes to match, what do we do in terms of ventilation for BEVs to make similar changes on the, the diesel equipment? So that at, if we consider utilization, for instance, in the diesel engine. Right? So we're not considering 100% power or 100% <coughs> ventilating, ventilating for nameplate. Then we can see that the BEV equipment becomes very expensive relative to what we would see for, for diesel. Uh, so it's sitting here at about 10% more expensive to run the diesel or the BEV equipment than to run the diesel equipment. If we look at the loader, all of a sudden, you know, we can see it's in, in all of the cases it's substantially higher um, than the diesel equipment. And if we allow everything to float out there, it's um, 17, 18 percent higher cost on the loaders than it just with the loaders themselves. Um, this comes around really for two two factors here. One is we need to have more of the smaller loaders. And the other factor is that the loader, battery loaders are just much, that much more expensive to operate in the home. Right. If we look at then the combined case um, for the trucks and the loaders, um, you can see all of a sudden now it's pushing on um, that system would be 25% or more, more expensive to run. Um, and I haven't 
push into here in, in these years yet. And the effect of the service of the drills um, generally a little bit marginal there. Um, so the, the effect is actually probably in the 10%. So we continue then um, a little bit um, busy right here. This is kind of gives us the idea of where we see changes in the, in the cost and the effect then of what the electrical power is at the bottom, what proportion of that is actually a diesel fuel cost, uh, what portion of this can be capital in the main raises, uh, and it's a little slimmer down there. Um, what's the capital cost on the fans? <coughs> capital cost on the refrigeration plant. Uh, the big green one, we can see there the difference of having diesel loaders versus battery loaders. Um, and the, the green one's in the middle. Uh, what we didn't uh, look at uh, within the notes, um, but we can see here, here uh, is the deep line cost. And what we're talking here is the cost of actually putting the ramp in, and if we put it in for the big 60 ton truck, or we put it in size for the smaller 50 ton truck, we were looking to see what that differential cost was. To see if there were really any things that came from there. Um, and then we've got the hallway cost, and that's the cost associated with the trucks and, and all of the energy on the, on the haul trucks. Uh, what's not included in here actually is that. The, the cost of the explosives and other fixed costs that would be similar between the two, two approaches. <clears throat> if we look at now the, the electrical demand profile, we see there's actually the underground underground fans. So this is an allowance basically just for the auxiliary fans, uh, which in this case is a bit larger than our surface then. I think we don't necessarily find that unsurprising. Uh, uh, and I'm looking at one, one operation now where we're looking at uh, 4,000 kilowatts of fans on the surface and over 6,000 kilowatts of auxiliary fans on the uh, it, It's just it's that big of a, of a difference. So to say that the 100, 100 kilowatt fans, the problem you got. 100 of them, 100 of them. And then the other factor then here is the difference in the refrigeration. Uh, and then you can see then really where that energy cost comes in uh, for the equipment up at the top. Uh, and really it's it's small in comparison to sort of the other electrical. So now let's look at Thinking outside a little bit on, on one of the other capital things we have to think about. Um, if we're looking at the battery swapping equipment, where are we going to do that? Uh, are we going to have the loaders actually have a battery swapping on the production level, or you have one every other level? Since you, if, you're, if you're on an intermediate level, you go down and you go up, swap the battery out, or you swap on your own level. Uh, in the case we were looking at here, it was very convenient to set that battery swapping station for the trucks up on the surface. Plenty of room. Uh, you don't have to buy special rooms for it. Um, you don't have to run the power cables on your ground for it. One of the things we're looking at somewhere, depending on, on the on the scheme, probably 400 to 1,000 kilowatt capacity in there per unit. Um, if we're looking at trying to do a, a 300 kilowatt hour battery recharge in 20 minutes, there's a, there's a megawatt to begin with. Uh, we need to look at the, the cost of getting the transmission underground, uh, how much additional power cables do we need to have? Uh, what do we need to do? Are we going to end up going possibly to uh, increasing uh, the voltage distribution underground, the voltage transmission underground? What is that? Um, when we look at the onboard or the opportunity charging uh, that we see for the, the, the jumbos and the, the jump and drill carriers that we see for the service equipment uh, that basically drive around, they, have, they can climb on the battery, 
and tell me where they were, and they still just went and plug, they plug into a jumbo box. Now we've got to provide additional outlet for them. We've got to increase the, the load center capacity. Now they're not necessarily taking as strong a charge as we see on the, the major equipment, but we do have to have some additional capacity to take that in. And then just the fact that we've got to run all this additional additional distribution of uh, capacity throughout the market as well. Now I'm making some observations in here. Uh, this kind of gets into some of our less than tangible effects. Uh, one of them certainly is, is the health effect that if we're running battery equipment, we're not putting the surfacement into the air, we're not putting carbon monoxide into the air, we're not putting uh, other hydrocarbons in. I always want to say sulfur dioxide, but with the ultra low sulfur fuel, that's not a problem anymore. The other issue that comes in is we're seeing the transition from the, the tier two, tier three diesel engines to where now we're realistically seeing tier four as a uh, an available engine, even in the biggest equipment. So the effect and the distance that we would have between a tier three or a tier three minus engine versus a tier four versus the battery is we're closing that gap between the diesel emissions and the no emissions from the battery equipment. Uh, factors of noise. Um, with the, the battery equipment, it's obviously much quieter. Uh, and the issues that I, you'll see there if you're in a line that's running electric equipment, um, particularly on the ramp. You don't hear it coming through. You uh, don't hear it coming up, and it's coming up heavy, and it's coming up fast. Um, and so the noise, the noise issue goes away. Working in there, maybe maybe we can get rid of some heavy, some hearing protection, and maybe that doesn't become an issue for us. The heat impacts. Uh, remember the diesel equipment; it's kicking out close to two times the rate of kilowatt. It's kicking it out of heat, and it's kicking it out of sensible heat, and it's kicking it out of latent heat. Uh, so you're running down into the potential health issues uh, and work, workplace issues with that. I put in here fueling, and whether we're doing manual or automated. Um, with the, with the diesel trucks, we're doing a lot of manual. Guys handling the the hose, filling the tanks, uh, and the, the potential risk to an explode a uh, spill of diesel fuel. Um, now you gotta wash the guy down his covered in. Um, but even on the battery side, if we're looking at plugging in our service equipment into the jumbo box, now we're basically we're plugging into a high voltage or medium voltage connection. And we're doing it a lot more often. Uh, again, two two activities we pretty much take for granted, but are we increasing the risk? Uh, and where is that? Um, from the emergency management perspective, two of the key things coming up that are being discussed nowadays um, is the issue of what are the differences between battery fire and a diesel tank fire. And the effect that we've seen um, with the work up in Ontario um, with these um, goes into this factor of um, what do we need to provide for the mine rescue team to help them deal with or prepare for having to deal with the battery fire. Uh, how are we going to train them? What, what is our evacuation procedure going to be? Um, I would add in here <clears throat> with this, one of the things that I, I, I've dealt with early in my career was actually getting um, bladders into the tanks on the diesel equipment. So that if we did have a tank struck, we wouldn't get a massive spill. And that may be something we, we have to go with the batteries is to isolate and protect the batteries so that if we do have an overheat or a thermal runaway, it's it's kept confined to the to the, to the cell. So trying to get some conclusions together here. Um, realistically, I think at this point we're looking at battery equipment being 15 to 20 percent higher in cost. Um, in a new uh, a new mine compared to, to diesel. Uh, now, 
if we go back to our concept of this plus or minus 20 25% cost estimate, we're looking at then the, the two are within the estimate of the working factor uh, based on the study. So we wouldn't necessarily throw the EV out. We might actually just have to come back and take a lot more, a, a lot deeper look at how they would uh, behave and how the cost profile would be when we get into feasibility. Uh, <clears throat> We do have uh, larger BEV loaders uh, in the pipeline uh, coming from at least two of the manufacturers uh, that they had them at, at Mine Expo. Uh, different approaches to how they manage batteries. Uh, one of them is an onboard charging uh, that has a 20 minute charge cycle. If you've got two charger units plugged into it, uh, the other is a battery swap system. Uh, and with the larger loaders, if we can get those better matched to our trucks, are we going to get better cycles off our trucks? Uh, and overall, I think we're going to see the, in the, the BEVs improve in performance through the foreseeable future. Um, this includes making the batteries cheaper. Um, batteries were a significant, significant cost in what was driving uh, the loaders in particular. Um, and does that then bring us into um, some cost conversions between what we see for our, our standby reliable diesel um, versus what we're bringing in now um, with the BEVs? And is there going to be a comparison between what we see in the mining equipment versus really what we see in terms of uh, uh, commercial uh, personal vehicle uh, battery versus uh, Gasoline or, or diesel. Um, you know, you look at a, even a small um, battery uh, vehicle um, at the, in the low end is still in the that forty thousand dollar range. You know, can we bring that down to what we would see for economy of cost? And are we going to see something similar uh, on the mining equipment? So right now, if you were to ask me, I think where, where we're at is that the BEV equipment is giving us a tool to use where it's appropriate um, rather than being in the position of, of displacing diesel equipment from, from our online tools. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ria, for your presentation. Uh, this is a uh, really like, nice topic. Uh, I believe there are a lot of questions that may be asked. So let us, like, we have almost 10 minutes uh, for QA session. So I'll start with a question. Uh, there are two questions in the chat. So, Carlos is saying that battery electric vehicles have a different fire profile and different ventilation needs when the fire happens. How would that impact the, the conversion? Yeah, I think this gets us to uh, one of the characteristics that we're looking at with, the, with our operation, uh, our basis operation, was we had the the haulage trucks um, within really their own ventilation circuit, as far as the mine was concerned, so that um, in, the, in the event that we had a fire, uh, whether it was diesel or whether it was battery, uh, that the air was intended not to go for the production levels, they were being uh, ventilated separately from the raises from the surface. And I, I think when we begin to look at those issues, the same we do with diesel. We've got to, to carry those characteristics in. Um, and um, I would say from what I've seen uh, over the last couple of years, we're still seeing some 
questionable practices of using ramp air for, for production level ventilation. Um, and uh, obviously there's, there's some risks with that. Um, and it's something we need to, to keep in mind. I hope that answers the question. Well, uh, another comment from Edwin uh, said, also in some cases, people believe that people believe they can't save and vent raise the government, but they forget that some of the vent raises required when considering diesel equipment can be used as a secondary or emergency equipment. That's that's correct. And again, it goes into setting up the, the overall ventilation scheme that you're going to be using um, and making sure that we've got good flow through um, ventilation through our working that we're carrying. Uh, we're carrying dust and we're carrying, um, you know, and don't forget to bring the, the, the blasting fumes, the blasting gases, um, dust, um, everywhere else. I think what I've seen within the application uh, there is looking to see what the minimum ventilation is um, with the concept that you could use um, series ventilation um, in place of parallel. Uh, and I don't necessarily think you can get away with that um, because you, there are still other pollutants that you're, you're trying to manage. Uh, and then that was an issue that it came up um, with an associate of mine was doing really work on uh, the, uh, the tier four issue, right? And, and it was when the tier four was becoming the thing and we were looking forward to it, the question came over well, can we really drop the airflow down by, by 90%? It's like, well, no, you really can't do that. Because, because now you, you change the focus from diesel particulate that we see now up to now it was it was it was heat, it was dust, it was something else. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the machine itself may no longer be the primary pollutant source of mineral work. Whether that happens, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, but it's keeping in mind that we're not just ventilating, but we're putting out of the tailpipe. Or it's not out of the tailpipe. So, I don't know that. So, one of the statements uh, was that uh, battery power treatment is usually faster, and that means shorter cycle. So, is there any uh, analysis on the ripple and breakboards of this equipment uh, uh, between uh, diesel and the, um, battery power equipment? Considering that uh, for either company policies or uh, local mining law, mm -hmm. where they state that the maximum speed for, for LHT is usually 50 kilometers per hour, and for whole crop is between 25 to 30 kilometers per hour. Yep. Is there any reason for having faster equipment if I can go over it? So, what's the purpose of having faster uh, battery power equipment at, at the end? Yeah, I, I think when we were looking at, at this in, in, case, in this particular case, um, the, the the maximum allowable speed on their on their ramp um, was actually significantly faster than either of the trucks were capable of. Uh, the, the question does come in on on truck and how fast can you allow the truck to go, um, and whether it's going up or going down. Um, clearly, we'd like to see trucks. Travel faster because we can high pressure driven travel. Um, for the trucks to go faster, and we've seen this with um, uh, trolley assisted um, trucks such as such as the Karuga truck, um, that in order to get them to go their maximum speed, uh, there's a lot of maintenance that has to go into the road. Uh, the road profile has to be very well maintained. Uh, and if you see where those trucks operate, uh, it looks like it's, it's been paved. I mean, it looks like I said to the other. Um, but um, as I said, then the, then the problem with those comes one is the, the electric truck you can't hear them coming, um, and you have to actually clear dispatch to go out onto the air. And so there is there is a push, I believe, to get as much speed out of the trucks as you possibly can. Um, and the battery trucks, you know, as you run. You run into it in the the, uh, the torque and the, the power curves are different um, than you get on a diesel system. Um, so 
what that's going to end up being, whether you're going to be able to get a full 45 kilometer capacity out of a 50 ton truck. Um, and this was actually nowhere near um, that kind of speed. So, uh, I think, does that answer your question? Yeah, so um, it's highly uh, conditioned to the specifics of the market. It, it is. At the country. It, it, it is in the country as well. So, yeah. um, and you know, it's, it's cases in here where we were looking in the way that the model was set up. There's actually a portion of the ramp that was uh, single direction traffic. So there were, there were actually two portals coming to the surface that went down um, and then they joined into a single decline. Uh, so there were sections where the trucks could, could actually run unimpeded. Uh, and then there was another section of it where the trucks would come in and you may have to have the downbound truck wait um, for the upbound truck players. And that's another factor that goes into the overall cycle. Thank you. Uh, Ian, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. Question one is, uh, what is the unit uh, on your class? Uh, when you compare the two alternatives? Uh -huh. Is it uh, dollars per ton? When, when we were looking, or yeah. CFM, dollar per yeah. CFM? When, when we were looking at, on the overall cost, when and it was normalized, um, that was that was life of mine total cost. Um, and so you took the life of mine total cost. Yeah. Okay. You didn't uh, divide that by the ton produced no. and, and no. said uh, this is. Uh, no. Okay. No. And because what we're looking at here, uh, and it is was there a cost, a life of mine cost justification to go to battery equipment? And here, clearly, there wasn't. Um, so we could have said, okay, what is it on a, on a per ton basis? Um, the issues there um, come in is that it has to be normalized to either a uh, uh, the weighted depth. Uh, and when we did all of the calculations on the truck cycles and how many tons were coming up, the TKM costs that are all, are all in that form. Uh, and we can then Come back and check that against the you know, you're, you're going to take if 90 percent of your production came off on one level uh, or if it was 10 percent coming off of that you can weight that out particularly over the 700 meters uh, of per ton and then that's where you see the bell curve and i uh, and i had another slide uh, that didn't go in that showed the the production curve and then the truck curve and the truck curve you know, lags the production curve because you're producing you're going you're actually producing top down in this case uh, so uh, and, and my uh, second question uh, now we have this carbon tax coming in uh -huh. right yeah and uh, i wonder uh how much carbon per ton mm -hmm. uh in the air that we put out from the uh, uh, yeah and uh, then the shaft or the, the, the ramp, how much carbon is in there uh, when we use the, the diesel? Yeah, diesel yeah. versus, uh, yeah. and if you pay tax on yeah. that, how much yeah. the cost difference is going to be between the two? And that, and in, in countries where you're going to have that come into play, uh, I think that that may tip the scales back. And it will swing the pendulum over a bit. Um, and, and I think when we look in North America, um, if you if you look at it um, from that perspective of making a decision to go to battery, it ends up being driven by the fact that you're going to get a tax credit for it um, for implementing. You're going to get a rebate of some form, right? If you're getting you're getting a benefit from the government, a benefit from the people to uh, actually um, use something that, that would otherwise not be possible. Thank you. Yep. You're, yeah. <clears throat> my opinion, if you uh, think about it, if you have to haul up a ramp, which in my opinion is, is, is not the ideal system, right? mm -hmm. you run a belt conveyor or, or you run a skateboard, so mm -hmm. running trucks up the ramp is, a, is an issue by itself. But if you do that, if you run electric trucks, 
uh, I think it would make sense to run trolley trucks and then yeah. uh, charge them on their way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's some there's some potential to do that. Um, I think the what what you would see then is the very very high capital cost of putting in the trolley system. Right, that would be an upfront cost, but if, if your life of mine is long enough, yeah, that'll even out. And, and yeah. that's that's the problem then with some with some of the mining operations. You get into very short mining life. Yeah, right. I mean, right. So yeah. short mining yeah. life, you're not yeah. you're not thinking about making a significant battery and everything. Yeah, and, and it is this issue between say a, a mine of having fifteen to twenty years mine life versus something that's going to have hundred years mine life. So, okay. Well, looks like we are out of time. So, thank you, Dr. Sariyan, again for. I thank you all for coming to finish this. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.